I can tell from that reception that you are all as thrilled as I am to be welcoming Arundhati Roy here to Edinburgh. Um, it's a huge honour and privilege for me to have the opportunity to speak with such a, a talented and accomplished writer and passionate activist. And I know everybody here at the Book Festival is absolutely thrilled that you're making your first appearance here in Edinburgh. So ladies and gentlemen, let's give another Edinburgh welcome to Aaron Dati Roy. Over the next 40 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to speak to uh, and with Arundhati about uh, each of these uh, amazing works, uh, all three of her books, uh, perhaps a bit about what it's like to be Arundhati Roy, particularly in the world we live in today and with current developments in India, um, and inevitably, given the relevance of so much of your writing to what is happening in India and Kashmir in particular, I, I guess we might touch on some politics as well. Uh, we'll then open the floor to some questions and then we will round off with uh, the great treat of Arundhati uh, doing a reading uh, and I think perhaps a, a reading throughout our session as well. But I wanted to to take you back, um, I guess, 20 years or just over 20 years, uh, the God of Small Things won the Booker Prize in 1997. I think it's fair to say it became a literary sensation that has sold millions of copies worldwide. It's also a reasonable guess that it changed your life and had a profound impact on your life. Do you want to, to tell us what that impact was, how you coped with that? Well, uh, you know, before, of course, I wrote The God of Small Things, I used to work in cinema and what we called lunatic fringe cinema, you know. <laughs> it was like really small uh, stuff. And uh, before that, I studied architecture. So when I started writing the novel, I, I thought I was uh, what they call downshifting, you know? Like if <laughs> 600 people watched the film, then maybe 200 would read a book. So I didn't even, I mean, I didn't even think it was possible for something like this to happen, you know? Um, it was, it was obviously exhilarating, but it happened so fast that it was pretty disconcerting too. You know, in fact, I was just telling a friend today that the night that I won the Booker, I had a weird dream, uh, which, like, I, I was just a fish in a in a, in a in a stream, and this kind of green hand came and picked me out and said, you're a very special fish <laughs> and you can have whatever you want. And I just was like, put me back, you know? <laughs> so it was, it was uh, disconcerting. And then of course, uh, it, was, uh, it came at a time when India was, was sort of taking the place at the high table, you know, and I was one of those those, those people who was, you know, apart from the book, the success or the prize, these things were sort of separate from the book, from the politics of the book even, which is the politics of, of caste and of kinds of violence and beauty and all of it that exists. But, uh, you know, and soon after it, there were the nuclear tests and I, I was in a position where I, you know, I had I had been sort of valorized to a point where uh, it was uncomfortable for me anyway. And then when this sudden sharp turn to the right began, I really had to declare my position that I'm not on this bus. You know, I'm not part of this. I don't want it. And that led to a huge backlash as well. So. 
yeah, it changed my life. It changed my life also uh, with the money, you know, like I, I, I never thought of myself as a person who, who would ever have money, you know. Um, and it, it, in fact, you know, the, there were times when one was so broke that the producer who, who, he, who made <laughs> the films that I had written before, he, told, he once called me and he said, I'll give you like 2,000 rupees or something, which is really nothing, you know, a month. You write whatever you like, but whatever you write will be mine, you know? <laughs> And I was like, does it say asshole on my forehead? <laughs> you know, come on. <laughs> but but uh, he said, well, you know, you can be as arrogant as you like, but take it in writing from me. You may be a brilliant person, but you will never have money. So I was like, okay. Well, so you proved him wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, to, to have money, you know, in that country, mm -hmm. in this time, what is and to be a political thinker. What does all this mean, you know? What does it mean to be famous, to, be, to have money in, in, in a world that you're so suspicious of, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, so there's a, there's a lovely, uh, in My Seditious Heart, which you were reminding me earlier on, is the most recently published of your three books, but of course some of the writing in here uh, is from around the time of uh, The God of Small Things, but uh, the, first essay in here, The End of Imagination, you tell this lovely story about a friend who's uh, worried that nothing that happens in your life after all of the excitement around your novel will match up and your life will, the rest of your life will turn out to be a disappointment and the only perfect ending to your perfect story is your own death, which was <laughs> a bit of a, a sort of pessimistic way of looking at it, but I know you're going to read from this uh, to round off our session, but it, it's fair to say you railed against this sense that fame and celebrity was really the pinnacle of somebody's life. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was not something that, you know, I mean, it's, it's fun, it's okay. I'm not, you know, so worthy that I'm saying, oh, I just want to spend my life spinning. <laughs> cotton like Gandhi or something, but <laughs> uh, but for me, you know, the excitement of what has happened over the last 20 years, the, 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 the journeys deep into the heart of the mm. things that are happening and were happening in India has been so much excitement, you know, so much, because what does, what does a writer crave in the end? A writer craves more than anything else in the world, a depth of understanding. And to be able to pursue that, you know, to be able to expand your, your soul in the ways that one has uh, traveling, uh, you know, because I, at one time, I think I wrote it, but I remember uh, saying this, you know, that at one time I felt as if, uh, you know, uh, uh, the royalties from like every every sentence is being sold for a silver coin and you're slowly turning into this little silver figurine mm. with a cold silver heart you know like you're everyone's trying to monumentalize you or freeze you in some space make you write the son of the god of small things and the niece of the god of small <laughs> things you know and i instead when i started to when i managed to to break out of that, you know, and I, and I uh, started to write the other political things, you know, the real royalty was, royalties uh, uh, were that I would be invited into the heart of insurrections, mm. into the secret spaces where other people would not be trusted because of what you wrote before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was, really, um, to me, the most fulfilling thing that any writer could want mm. or crave, you know? And to get your heart broken again and again, but who wants an unbroken heart, you know? I don't. Like, mine is just shattered, mm. but, you know. Yeah, and, and in those 20 years, your non-fiction writing was prolific, but of course it is, it is often commented upon that 
there is this 20 year gap between The God of Small Things and your second novel, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. Uh, I heard a previous interview you did where you said, and I think you've you know, touched on this already, that you didn't want to become a, a novel writing factory. Was that why the gap was so long that you, you wanted instead to deepen your experience and understanding, or, or did it just take that length of time for another novel to form itself? Actually, I, I mean, in retrospect, I guess I could theorize about it, but in, practically, in, in, in a practical way, uh, I live my life unplanned, you know? I didn't plan that I would uh, write The God of Small Things. I didn't plan that I wouldn't write a book for 20 years, a, a novel for 20 years. For me, I think the kind of novels that I write, they are sort of, uh, I mean, one is immersed in, uh, they're not about a subject or a plot, you know, they're about a, a, a universe that you need to sort of be immersed in and marinated in before you can write that kind of a mm. book, you know, which is not to say it's the only kind of book to write, but just the way I write, you know. So also, you know, those 20 years, India was changing at a mm. pace uh, there was, there was, and always is the sense of urgency, you know. So, uh, I, I, th I said to someone that my seditious heart, which is 20 years of writing, is a an archive of urgency, actually, mm -hmm. you know, of intervening when closes, uh, spaces are closing down. The media had become immensely corporatized. Like today you have 424 hour news channels. There, there's, a, there's a huge assault on the most vulnerable, you know. Uh, there's a sort of consensus that is built up, uh, they echo of each mm -hmm. other. And for whatever it's worth, I, I had the space to break that consensus from time to time and to say, hey, there's another way of looking at this. There's another way of thinking about development or progress or civilization, you know? So there was that sense of uh, an urgent intervention and also a sense of uh, developing a, a, a way of intervening which combined, I think, the skills of a fiction writer mm -hmm of an academic, of a journalist, of, of, of also a free person. That was also important, a free person, you know, who not even an academic who's looking for a promotion in the university, because, yes. for example, there's an essay here called The Doctor and the Saint, which is about the debate between Gandhi and his greatest intellectual, moral, and political opponent called Dr. Ambedkar, who was, who belonged to what were then known as the untouchable classes. Ambedkar, you know, more or less was being wiped out of history or then reinvented in ways which left out who he really was. So you can't really write about Gandhi in the way I have in that if you want a space in yeah. the establishment, you know? Yeah. There's no doubt this is, well, in, in my view, it, it's the most important anthology of writing, chronicling India and what's happened to it and, and in it over the past 20 years. And so many of the themes that are, are so strong in your novels, you know, here uh, are obviously recurring. Um, before we, we maybe come on to talk about some of these themes later, but um, The God of Small Things uh, obviously won the Booker. You were the first Indian woman still living in India to, to win the, the Booker Prize. Um, this is a love story. It's you know, a family tragedy. Uh, the issue of caste is obviously central to it. But what what inspired this? How how long did this novel take to to form in your mind? Well, uh, this um, I, I I I've never been able to answer that question. You know, what inspired it? Because. It's just something that I started writing, and I think once uh, there's this sort of uh, part of me which is 
always in search of language, always in search of a language with which to tell, to explain the way I think. And that language, yes, in a way it's English, but it's, it's an English which is enriched and deepened by a culture that lives in several languages, you know? So the God of Small Things is imagined in English as well as in Malayalam, which is the language that I you know, used to speak when I was young in Kerala. The ministry is, 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 is enriched by more than one language. And uh, it was just, it's just this, uh, you know, sometimes I just think it's almost like trying to tell somebody you love about the world you, the world you see. Mm -hmm. Not this is the world I grew up in, this is the world I live in now and mm -hmm. see. And, and I would say like, if my nonfiction is an argument, the fiction is a construction of a universe for someone that I love to say, okay, let's just walk through this and let me show you the way, you know, these little streets and roads. And, and it connects all of these themes. And poetry and jokes yeah. and, 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 and the God of small things is, is yes, it's a, it's, it's, it, uh, yeah, it's a love story, but it's, I, I'd say that it's the story of a family with a broken heart yeah. at its center and this is, it begins with a shattered heart. Yeah. And then people bring those little shards together and make a mended heart in a graveyard outside Old Delhi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I, I, I read The God of Small Things, probably around the time it was published, and reread it just a couple of weeks ago in preparation for speaking to you today. And on rereading it, I think the, the politics of the novel seemed to be much more to the fore than I remember when I read it the first time. Cass, obviously, but class, colonialism, communism. Is that a fair reading it? Is it a more political uh, novel than I perhaps mean, I, I uh, That's what I always say, you know, when people say, oh, she wrote a novel and then she started writing politically. Yeah. I'm like, really? I mean, the <laughs> God of small things. I got uh, the first, uh, I mean, every, Every few years, uh, the story, a pattern repeat, repeats itself in my life, which is that five male lawyers get together and file a case against me. <laughs> so <laughs> the, first, the first case was uh, ag for against me for the god of small things, and it was for corrupting public morality <laughs> and obscenity. <laughs> and uh, you know, by the time the case came into court, uh, I had won the booker and then there was this problem, like now do we claim her or <laughs> condemn her, you know? So the judge came up and said, every time this case comes before me, I get chest pains. <laughs> so <laughs> that was that. But uh, subsequently, uh, you know, the political writing again, I had, when I started writing about the dams and so on, and I, I had, uh, an, again, a case for contempt of court, this was, you know, for lowering the dignity of the court or something. And the judges would be like throwing this essay of mine called The Greater Common Good from one judge to another, referring to me as that woman. And I used to call myself the hooker that won the booker. <laughs> 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 so it was like, and then, and then um, they basically asked me to, to apologize for my language and basically, you know, disrespectful tone. And I, I refused. So they, they sent me to prison for a day, but they, they said, she's not behaving like a reasonable man. <laughs> because a reasonable man is a concept in law. Yeah. It's my kind of woman who doesn't behave like a reasonable man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Your books are, uh, your novels, it's often said that there's a, a touch of magic realism about them, although I, personally I think that's more, a, it's more apparent than, than real. I mean, your books are, are ultra real. They're about the impact of big forces beyond your character's control on 
on their lives. And, uh, you know, can a book like that ever not be political? Well, I, I guess it depends on, you know, this word political, it has such a vast yeah. set of meanings, you know? So uh, people think, you know, politics is just about elections. Some people, uh, I mean, what is not, oh, it's yeah. not a new question I'm asking, but what is not political, you know? For example, I think that uh, in India, somehow the intellectual upper caste, including the left, have managed to produce so much work where they just don't address the issue of caste. Mm. Now, this is political, you know. It's like you have to assume an extremely complex yoga posture to not <laughs> address the issue of caste. And if you don't address it, to me, it's political. But yeah. they'll say, oh, it's not, you know. So it, it, it really, it's really a, it's really a question of uh, what is it that you're trying to avoid seeing? Or what is it that is making you uncomfortable? Uh, you know, that, that you can categorize the world in these ways. This is political, but this is art. Mm -hmm. That's crap. You know, at the same time, th there's the other thing that's true. I mean, my friends, uh, you know, some of my friends, very close friends now, who were involved in this really remarkable uh, movement against big dams, which to me yeah. is the foundation of my political understanding. Yeah. When I first met them, they, I, I didn't know them then, and they, they said, we are doing some art exhibition. P people have given us some paintings to raise money for the movement, and will you come and inaugurate it? So I said, I don't do that shit, you know, like inaugurate <laughs> things and all that. If I do anything for you, it'll be better than that. So they said, will you just come? So I said, OK. I went, and I just saw these really mediocre paintings, and I left, you know? <laughs> so later they told me, oh, we thought you were like a really cruel person. I said, why? They said, you just came and looked at these paintings and laughed and left. <laughs> so I said, look, as far as I'm concerned, there's no excuse for bad art. <laughs> like, even if you're like against dams or politically correct <laughs> or whatever, you know, please just spare us the mediocre stuff, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> that was it. Excellent. One of the, the, the sort of little nuggets in uh, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness that always stayed with me for some, this is a book that has a multitude of characters. Some of them burst onto the page for a paragraph and disappear again. And there's a security guard in here who's guarding a billboard. Yeah. And there's some, uh, he, he's thinking or he's dreaming or he's thinking about his dreams and says in his village still exists in his dreams. It's not yeah. drowning at the bottom of a yeah. dam reservoir. And that, you know, that, passion about that you have and, and the way you scrutinize the impact of development, rapid development on, on natural resources, on culture, on identity, communities. There's another security guard, I thought you were going to mention him, who, who becomes, of course, one of the major characters yeah. called Saddam Hussein, in, who calls himself Saddam Hussein eventually, but he is guarding uh, a stainless steel yeah. tree in, in, in an art gallery made by this very famous sculpt, uh, pay, uh, sculptor. And uh, eventually, his job is to clean the tree and keep an eye on the tree. And the tree keeps mm. uh, shining the sun on, into his eyes, and they burn, you know? And he wears these dark glasses. <laughs> yeah, that's also, uh, you know, what what comes out of the earth, Absolutely. a stainless steel tree. Yeah, and he's one of the really uplifting characters in, mm. in the book as well. This, so, well, you, you'll correct me if you think I'm wrong here, but uh, it's not in any way diminishing this uh, masterpiece to say that this is a much, much more complex novel, structurally and thematically. Yeah. It does have a multitude of characters. You deal with a, a variety of themes. In many respects, it, it feels like more than one novel in, in the package, well, firstly, I find it a very difficult novel to summarize. How would you summarize it? And perhaps 
this is a moment yeah, for well, you maybe to you do know, a I, reading I from it. I, I think you can't, you, you shouldn't ever write a novel that you can summarize, because <laughs> then you should just, <laughs> then you should I'm, just. I'm a politician, I like to be able to <laughs> reduce things to Just write bites. a summary. <laughs> but uh, yeah, to me, sometimes I think this, this is, this might be, uh, this might be a city and not yeah. a novel, you know? And in a city you have that, you have those people, right? Uh, to me, it was like, y you know, you can't just walk past this person and think, oh, he sells cigarettes, or he's a guard, or he's, a you, you got to know where he came from, and he's going to tell you, or she's going to tell you, you know? You, 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 you can't, you have to, you can't motor down the city, mm. you have to live in it, get lost in it, smoke a cigarette with the guy you meet, or the woman that you like to hang around with for a while. So uh, yes, it, it, to me, uh, I, I mean, I'm a student of architecture and then of urban planning. And uh, when I write a novel, the structure is everything, you know? So it's almost like when, when you look at that huge city, like a city of Delhi, not just the setting, S of course the setting is partially in Delhi and a lot in Kashmir, but uh, the idea of, 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 of a city that you try and design, then it undesigns itself, and then you design it some more, and that's what I felt this book was like, you know, that, that you, you let it go, and then you gather it, and then you let mm. it go, and then you gather it. And I liked the fact that uh, it's not baby food. You know, it is not like baby food. I think <laughs> absolutely. People, it's people for that. have to. People have to. Uh, but it is huge. This yeah. this is a, a hugely challenging book for a reader, which I I like. I think that is is wonderful. But if you lose focus, you can yeah. get mm. absolutely lost in it. You bring yeah. characters from the background to the foreground, and yeah. and then they disappear again. You know, and sometimes the city itself is a character. Absolutely, and, and a major. Ca but yeah. if that's a challenge for a reader writing a book as structurally complex as this must be an enormous challenge for you as a, it a writer. Was, but, but to me, it was like, what is the point of writing something that isn't a challenge? I agree. Know? Like for me, I, uh, I, I um, you know, I can't think in a simpler way anymore. You know, I really can't. Yeah. Like it's, it's just, uh, and in truth, there, there isn't anything in this book, although it appears chaotic, every single detail, you know, if you trace it, if you pick any one thing and trace it, you'll find the thread right through, you know? So uh, it was, it was uh, very, very interesting to try it, you know? It was a risk, but... Well, in my humble uh, opinion, you succeed hugely. Thank you. Know. <laughs> So uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll read a little bit from it. Just um, this part of the book is towards the end of the book, and it's a chapter called "The Untimely Death of Miss Jubin the First. It's it's uh, as you will follow. This part of it un un unravels in Kashmir. Today, Kashmir is. Uh, is, is a great tragedy. The Indian government has locked it down, uh, cut off all communication, fire, uh, about half a million soldiers on the street, and it has dissolved the former state of Jammu and Kashmir. It's a, I mean, I don't wanna explain it now, but it's unbelievable what has been done in the last two weeks. So it starts, this chapter starts with a quote from James Baldwin, and they would not believe me precisely because they would know that what I said was true. Ever since she was old enough to insist, she had insisted on being called Miss Jubin. It was the only name she would answer to. Everyone had to call her that. Her parents, her grandparents, the neighbors too. She was a precocious devotee of the Miss fetish that gripped the Kashmir Valley in the early years of the insurrection. 
All of a sudden, fashionable young ladies, especially in the towns, insisted on being addressed as Miss. Miss Momin, Miss Ghazala, Miss Farhana. It was only one of the many fetishes of the times. In those blood-dimmed years, for reasons nobody fully understood, people became what can only be described as fetish-prone. Other than the Miss fetish, there was a nurse fetish, a PT instructor fetish, and a roller skating fetish. <laughs> so in addition to check posts, bunkers, weapons, grenades, landmines, Cassipiers, concertina wire, soldiers, insurgents, counterinsurgents, spies, special operatives, double agents, triple agents, and suitcases of cash from the agencies on both sides of the border. The valley was of also awash with nurses, PT instructors, and roller skaters. <laughs> and of course, misses. Among them, Miss Jubin, who didn't live long enough to become a nurse, nor even a roller skater. In the mazar e shahoda the martyr's graveyard where she was first buried, the cast iron signboard that arched over the main gate said in two languages, we gave our todays for your tomorrows. It's corroded now, the green paint faded, the delicate calligraphy flecked with pinholes of light. Still, there it is after all these years, silhouetted like a swatch of stiff lace against the sapphire sky and the snowy sawtoothed mountains. There it still is. Miss Jabin was not a member of the committee that decided what should be written on the signboard, but she was in no position to argue with its decision. Also, Miss Jabin hadn't notched up very many todays to trade in for tomorrows. But then the algebra of infinite justice was never so rude. In this way, without being consulted on the matter, she became one of the movement's youngest martyrs. She was buried right next to her mother, Begum Arifa Yesri. Mother and daughter died by the same bullet. It entered Miss Jabin's head through her left temple and came to rest in her mother's heart. In the last photograph of her, the bullet wound looked like a cheerful summer rose arranged just above her left ear. A few petals had fallen on her coffin, the white shroud she was wrapped in before she was laid to rest. Miss Jabin and her mother were buried along with 15 others, taking the toll of their massacre to 17. At the time of their funeral, the Mazar e Shahoda was still fairly new, but was already getting crowded. However, the Intizamia Committee, the organizing committee, had its ear to the ground from the very beginning of the insurrection and had a realistic idea of things to come. It planned the layout of the graves carefully, making ordered, efficient use of the available space. Everyone understood how important it was to bury martyrs' bodies in collective burial grounds and not leave them scattered in their thousands, like bird feed up in the mountains or in the forests around the army camps and torture centers that had mushroomed across the valley. When the fighting began and the occupation tightened its grip, for ordinary people, the consolidation of their dead became in itself an act of defiance. Thank you so much. That is, is wonderful. Um, so much, this is a book, of course, about borders and boundaries and outsiders, minorities. You know, one of the main characters is transgender, the, the border between male and female, um, you know, life and death, gra graveyards, the literal graveyard yeah. that becomes Jeanette Guest House and how you describe Kashmir. What, what's the significance of the graveyard? Actually, you know, again, uh, sometimes uh, when I'm writing, I don't know. You know, it's only afterwards I, I start 
sort of, I can, I can talk about it, although that might not necessarily have been how yeah. I conceived it, you know. But uh, one of the things about India is I think that few people realize, you know, when you think of India or when people talk about India, they talk about Bollywood and chaos and cows and it's all sort of cuddly and warm and Gandhi and the Beatles and mm. whatever. But in fact, it's a society that lives in a hierarchical grid of caste, of ancestral occupations, of um, you know ethnic divisions, and these are hard. You know, these are violent, and uh, and then there are those of us, including me, who who are outside of those divisions. I mean, that's a lot of what the God of Small Things is about. And when you're off that grid, somehow you encounter everyone who's off the grid, which is not many, mm -hmm. but whoever they are. And so in the Ministry of Atmos Happiness, it really is about so many, so many layers and layers of identity, you know? And so in today's world where um, even among progressive people, identities are being made so shallow. You see, for example, one of the main characters, she's called Anjum. She's a Shia Muslim born in Old Delhi um, in the 1950s. And she's born as Aftab, as a boy. And then she becomes Anjum. And she moves into this, into this home called the Khwabga. The Khwabga in Urdu means the house of dreams, you know, where a lot of people like her live. And this is very common, in, you know, in, in, in India, it's not, it's not magic realism. And uh, just in that Khwabga, there are people of so many genders, you know. But Anjum's dangerous identity today is not that of being a trans woman. Mm -hmm. Her dangerous identity is of being a Shia Muslim, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. So she gets caught up in the 2002 massacre because she's a Muslim. She escapes mm -hmm. because she's uh, a hijra, as they call people like her in Urdu. And then she can't, she can't go back to her normal life having seen what she's seen. So she moves into a graveyard where she lives in this wild, feral specter of absolute sorrow, uh, not just because of what happened to her in Gujarat, but all the other things she's lost. And then she gathers herself and she build, starts to build a guest house called the Jannat guest house. Jannat is, uh, Jannat means paradise in Urdu. And every room in the guest house has a grave. And by, by the time the, the novel ends, if you see who lives in that guest house, who, it becomes the Jannat guest house and funeral services, <laughs> where she basically, any people who are not not really buried by, by uh, you know, Maulana, the people who would, you know, prostitutes, or yep. mm -hmm. all kinds of people are buried there. And when you look at the prayers that are said, and the people that live there and die there, you have the Fatiha, you have the recitation of Shakespeare, you have the singing of the Internationale, and it's like a revolution, you know. And so you have this graveyard in Delhi with the paradise guest house. And then you have the paradise of Kashmir covered in graveyards. And who are the people in the book? They are all people who have borders running through them, borders of gender, borders of religion, borders of caste. You have borders between humans and animals, borders between life and death, borders between Kashmir and India, all sort of porous and questioned. Uh, as they become increasingly hardened in the architecture of fascism that is growing around us. So uh, it just is something that is, I think it's just part of my DNA. That's how I am, you know, a person with many kinds of borders mm. running through me. And um, even the, I mean, it's not, it's a lot of people think these are just characters in this book are just people who are, on the edge of society or people who have been neglected. No, there are some, I mean, there's a very, very upper caste, brilliant, internal man of the state mm. called Gar who, whose name is Biplop Das Gupta. 
um, he's an intelligence officer, and he has a border running through him too, because half of him is the is the state, you know, half of him is the person who can look at a tragedy and analyze it and pull back and feel nothing mm. and wait. And the other half of him is this, this thwarted lover who's drunk and who's slowly <laughs> devolving into <laughs> some very human puddle, you know? Mm. So he too has a border running through him. Mm. And, and he, he's a brilliant guy. In fact, when I was writing him, I was almost losing my mind, you know, because I was creating my nemesis in a way, you know? It would have been easy to create easy meat, you know, like somebody who you can just mm. defeat. But it's not that easy with him because he's a, a brilliant man, but on the yeah. other side mm. of the mirror, you know, looking into your brain. And I thought I was looking into his, but mm -hmm. he was also looking into mine. <laughs> you know? Some of the characters in uh, Ministry of Most Happiness appear to be fictional versions of real people, including perhaps uh, Modi, huh. which takes <laughs> us to India today. I mean, it strikes me, well, you, you talked earlier on about going from being fated um, as the winner of the Booker Prize, a symbol of, of modern, successful, prosperous, ascendant India, to today being, I think it's fair to say, uh, not a supporter of the current path that India is on, a, a critic of the government, a supporter of, of Kashmir rights. It's actually, it's actually um, extraordinary, you know, this morning uh, a young man whatsapped me a picture of himself holding my seditious heart and it just said our seditious yeah. heart and and he said you know uh, I'm reading this and I can't tell you the ways in which it's changing my I, I don't remember exactly the words but so, somehow changing my internal architecture you know and I said you know the thing that makes me sad about this book is that when the, uh, uh, and, and you know, always uh, somehow my, my, my understanding of things seems to, seems to be a radar for how language suddenly changes. Mm -hmm. And in 1998, when India did the nuclear tests, I knew that we were on a path which would only end here. Mm -hmm. So it's horrible to read that essay now, you know, and I said to him, I said, you know, the sad thing for me is I'm, I'm not somebody who came from some political family or from some activist family or nor am I a trained historian, but I could see it coming. And the people who paved the way were the liberals. The people who paved the way for this to happen were the liberals who, who just kept minimizing the threat, who just kept looking away, who just somehow became utterly opaque to what was going on, you know, until now when they are all in shock, yeah. you know, whereas the one thing I'm not in is shock, you know. I, you could just see it coming from a distance very, very clearly because the language changed. Mm. The nuclear test changed the public language in India. It became a language of aggression, of annihilation, of nationalism or fundamentalism mm. and that just got more and more hardened yeah. as we went on you know yeah it can be crude and overly simplistic to draw comparisons between india you know trump brexit what's happening in countries like turkey there are clearly differences as well as similarities but is it possible in your view to to join the dots? No, definitely, you know, I mean, uh, you can see, uh, like, it's, so, it's when, when, when I read uh, a, a, a nuanced um, piece about, you know, what caused the rise of Trump and the, how the Democrats created a, a space where they abdicated their responsibility mm -hmm. to the working class, you know, you can see all that. The, the one difference I would say is that in India, there is an organization called the RSS, which, sounds, which stands for the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh. It is a far-right Hindu nationalist organization, 
started in 1925, and Modi belongs to it, so do most of his ministers. Now this organization, you see, uh, the Western world went through fascism, it was, dis, uh, it was dismantled, and now it's coming back. But this organization has just been coming, you know, so it has the ideas of uh, Aryan superiority, it has the texts, the sacred texts that it claims uh, uh, Hindu, you know, Hindu supremacy, but it also has the boots on the ground. It also has the myriad organizations, the armed militias, the, it has penetrated every, every institution of the Indian state now. I showed you yeah. just briefly a video I received this morning, a member of the Legislative Assembly addressing a huge crowd saying, you know, every Hindu should have an AK-47, we want rivers of blood, we want Modi to give us 20 minutes where he promises that we will have a free hand, we'll wipe the Muslims off the face of this place, you know. I mean, th th they have, we, we are watching lynchings, we're watching people of particular communities, Muslims, Christians, and of course their big enemies are intellectuals on the left being targeted in way from mainstream TV stations. You're seeing people who, who've been filmed lynching people being let off by court. Yeah. You're watching people being lynched over eight hours, being forced to chant, Muslims being forced to just chant Hindu slogans and being lynched, yeah. you know? One of the, f well, there's many frightening aspects to what you're telling us here, but one of them is we don't see this at all. We don't the coverage see it of because India is, here is a market-friendly yeah. democracy, right? So it's a good investment yeah. destination. I mean, recently there's a, there's a horrendous law called the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. Last, on the 1st of August, it was amended. The Home Minister, who himself has been in jail as a prime accused for a series of murders, and then the judge who was trying the case also <laughs> died, and then he was acquitted by the next judge. Anyway, he, he actually said in Parliament that, uh, you, know, they cha you know, the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act could the state could um, basically declare groups as terrorist groups. Now they've said we can declare any individual without any proof that this person is a terrorist, he can be or she can be arrested. And he said, you know, the real terrorists are the people who are writing the propaganda. You know, so in, in yeah. you know, basically writers, journalists, intellectuals, these are Terrorists. And what's happening in Kashmir then, seen in the, is, is part of a bigger, the, a no, bigger plan. No, what's happening in Kashmir was just at last, uh, uh, on the 5th and 6th of August. Kashmir, uh, like I, s I, I just written a piece in the New York Times about how people, people think of the violence between Hindus and Muslims came from 1947 and partition when, when the Muslim country of Pakistan was created separated that from secular India. But in fact, partition is a, f is, a, is, a, is a flawed word because it makes it sound like there was a hole that was par then partitioned. But actually, the violence came as much from the assimilation of these 500 princely mm -hmm. kingdoms, as they were called. And one of them was Jammu and Kashmir, which, which, which got divided between India and Pakistan in ways that were, uh, were, was not decided by the people. And last week, uh, that state was dissolved as a legal entity unilaterally by the Indian government. L the people have been locked down. It's the densest military occupation in the world since 1990, something like 70,000 mm -hmm. people have lost their lives. And now it's just, uh, phone lines, internet, everything was yeah. cut, and this was done. And now it's still like that. I mean, though the occasional moments when f yeah. a couple of phones work, but how can how can you cut off seven million yeah. people from the world just because you feel like 
Yeah, I have many constituents. I was saying to Arundhati earlier in Glasgow who are Kashmiri, who have family there and who've been unable to, yeah. to make contact. It's you know, I mean, we are, we are just all of us yeah. unable to talk to anybody there and yeah. don't know what's going on. My last question before I... I, 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 I temptation here for me is to monopolize you for hours um, <laughs> before I open to a couple of questions from the audience is what it's like for somebody like you, a, a writer, an activist, a, a critic of the government and the direction of India, um, what's it like for you living in India? I mean, to be blunt about it, is it safe? Well, you know, it would be uh, first of all, I, I just want to uh, say that it's not just me, you know. There, there's a lot of people who are standing up to this and all of them are in danger. Already, I mean, there have been journalists, writers, thinkers who've been assassinated by these right-wing, mm, you know, vigilante groups. Uh, the, uh, you know, if Kashmir is occupied by an army, right now India's occupied by a mob you know, by the mob, not a mob, but the mob. So uh, it would be foolish to, to, to not be cautious, you know? And at the same time, uh, you know, there is something uh, so enraging about it, about what's going on, that you, do, you just feel like standing your ground, as many people are, you know, even though we are being pushed to the wall and even though it seems like sometimes that juggernaut is impossible to stall. But then you think, you know, that I, uh, I mean, uh, a, a very beloved uh, friend and writer, uh, John Berger, who died year before last, he and I were once having a conversation and he said, why do you do this? You know, why do you, why do you just write uh, when you know that? So I said, why do you do it, John? Like, why are you asking me as <laughs> if you don't know? You know, so he said, we do it because we know that when we put down the story, we're saying we will never be zero. Wow. You know, we will at least put down the story. You know, even if we lose, we're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to be on your side, you know? So uh, there is that sense of, to put it politely, fuck you, you know? These are the kind of things that, as a politician, I often want to say, but can't. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for articulating that on behalf of all of us. Um, we'll put the lights up. Just one cheeky, cheeky last question for me is, is there a third novel in gestation? Um, I'm just, uh, you know, honestly, right now, uh, one of the things that I've never m managed to uh, deal with is that you know, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, for example, it's, <laughs> it's been translated into 51 languages, wow. right? So 51 uh, languages is, 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 is something. Like, I've worked very hard with the Urdu and Hindi translations because those are very important for me. But, you know, y y there's a way of, there's a sort of, uh, you know, one has to exist in this world, like, Next, next month I'm going to the Ukraine where it's getting translated. And so it, it just takes a while when you yeah. do a work like this to, 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 to have this head space, mm. you know, to think. And then all these things that are happening right now. So, but, but to me, as a writer now, I just think that fiction is 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 what I love, you know, and fiction is what I'll do, but I don't know when and okay. I'm never in a hurry. That's what I love okay. about fiction. <laughs> I'm just like when I Your readers are in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you so much um for fascinating us with your your thoughts about your books and, and about the world that we live in. I'm going to 
take uh, a couple of questions from the audience. Arndati is going to end our session with another reading, and I want to, to leave time for that. But can I see hands from anybody? There's a question here from a lady in the second row, or is that the third row? Just here in the front. Um, so you already mentioned that we here in the West and Europe, we don't hear a lot about India in the news, but our world is becoming increasingly connected and more complicated and a lot of people are scared by that. How do you think we should address this as a society? How do we stay informed as not global citizens, but people who are connected by more and more ways we can't untangle ourselves anymore? Well, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, where people are more and more connected and yet the information is more and more curated, you know, in, s in a strange way. Like, how can you, the reason that we are more and more connected is also the reason that seven million people can be unconnected, like by a government in one second. It's just un thinkable, you know, that something like that is happening. And, and um, sometimes everybody being connected makes it so vast that it makes you sort of helpless, you know. So it, it's important to be connected down into the ground as well as laterally, I think. That's very, very important, you know, and that is what is being lost right now, you know. So uh, I, I, was just, I was just watching, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen that film called The Great Hack about Cambridge Analytica and how the future, our future as democracies, our future as people who think that we can control those who rule us, uh, we are losing that control very, very fast, you know and money, data, these things are being used now to manipulate on a scale that is unbelievable. I don't, I mean, I sincerely, India has become like a one party republic because you can't have a one party democracy, that's a oxymoron, but you know, accumulation of capital, of data, of all this by one political organization is, is, uh, is where many people are heading, you know, and it's very dangerous. So um, I think, I think to, to understand what is being poured into our heads is, is also, s it's also a problem of connectivity, you know, where children, children um, before they can even think are, are being given data, you know, so that data controls the way you think, although you think it doesn't, yeah. you know. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take probably another couple of questions because time, unfortunately, is against us. There's one uh, up the back here, and then I, I saw a hand down here. Uh, thank you so much. Um, my question is really, um, you've, you've painted a picture which obviously is quite bleak about India today, and I noticed that you talked about um, sort of how liberals and maybe even the left have perhaps been culpable in what is happening in India. So my question is, do you see any scope at all within India itself for any kind of hope to try to challenge what is taking place? Well, one of the things that, you know, one of the things that I, I really, um, I mean, I really think about, you know, is that can anybody help, you know, I, I, I doubt it in some real way. Ultimately, uh, ultimately, the story of fascism is that it dies. But what is the price that we will pay as it plays itself out, you know? Is there any ray of hope? Well, there are, you know, I mean, uh, there are, as I said, many people who, who understand what's happening but there are many factors that prevent that understanding from becoming a real, um, a real political resistance. At the moment, opposition parties within the electoral politics in India have more or less dissolved. They more or less 
don't exist. They're more or less completely ineffective. So it's down to 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 the people, you know, uh, to to find uh, a way out. But it is the people too that are becoming so frightening. You know, it is the people that are. Uh, uh, if you look at the internet, you know the kind of things that are being said. Once, once say, for example, Kashmir has been dissolved. Uh, you you look at the net, and it's just full of Hindu nationalists talking about now we can get Kashmiri girls, and now we can go and take over the land. And so, so this whole left idea of the people's paper and the people's this and the people's that, the people have become very scary suddenly. So some people will, will fight. What the price we pay for it and when we'll come out, I don't know because I can't, I don't be some, you know, tell you some fairy tale about hope. I don't, I don't know, it's, 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 it's terrifying. I mean, let me say that many of us just stay awake at night uh, thinking about it all the time. It's, it's, it's the, the danger is clear and present and all the time there, you know. Okay. I'm going to take one final question, if you can perhaps keep it as brief as, as possible, and then I'm going to hand over to Arundhati to end with a, another reading. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, I've been born and raised in India and came to Scotland and lived half, more than half of my life here. And I'm sitting in front of these two lovely women who represent what I am. We are talking about borders and commonality as well. And I think the third commonality we have is that we are all a woman. So this question is more to Nicola. Um, <laughs> how do you, stripped of everything, the first ministership, um, everything, how do you combine just as a pure human being, the two facets that you're exhibiting here, the literary side and also the, the political side. Thank you. Well, how um, I keep myself sane in a mad, mad world is read people like <laughs> Arundhati. Literature for me is, is my way of maintaining equilibrium, of trying to deepen my understanding of the world we live in and, and gaining a perspective and an empathy that is so important in my view in the life of any political leader. I have a theory that if more political leaders read more literature, the world wouldn't be in quite the state. I was. It <laughs> right now. I was. Uh, when 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 I was uh, you know invited to come and and I was going to meet you, I was thinking what a delight it is to have a politician who reads <laughs> because we had I'm sure many of you heard this joke before but it started out with Reagan then it went to Bush and of course now it's Trump about President Reagan's library burnt down and both his books were burnt <laughs> and and he hadn't finished coloring one of them <laughs> so, so <laughs> it was like it is Truly, I think one of the great tragedies that people who who are really controlling so much about policy and the world are becoming less and less able to yeah. read, you know, and to understand. Yeah, um, look, I think that's a perfect note. I, I I think I'm about to get sacked as an interviewer <laughs> because I'm going way over time, uh, but I'm sure uh, none of you mind that. <laughs> We're going to round off what's been a truly remarkable uh, experience for all of us here listening to uh, Arundhati uh, by asking her to uh, read from, I, I think, the first essay yeah. in My Seditious Heart. So this is the first political essay called The End of Imagination, which was about the new India's nuclear tests. And uh, this, this is just a small chapter called The Bomb and I. In early May, before the bomb, I left home for three weeks. I thought I would return. I had every intention of returning. While I was away, I met a friend of mine whom I have always loved for, among other things, her ability to combine deep affection with a frankness that borders on savagery. <laughs> I've been thinking about you, she said, about the god of small things, what's in it, was over it, under it, around it, above it. 
She fell silent for a while, and I was uneasy and not at all sure that I wanted to hear the rest of what she had to say. She, however, was sure that she was going to say it. <laughs> In this last year, less than a year actually, you've had too much of everything. Fame, money, prizes, adulation, criticism, condemnation, ridicule, love, hate, anger, envy, generosity, everything. In some ways, it's a perfect story, perfectly baroque in its excess. The trouble is that it has or can have only one perfect ending. Her eyes were on me with a slanting, probing brilliance. She knew that I knew what she was going to say. She was insane. She was going to say that nothing that happened to me in the future could ever match the buzz of this, that the whole of the rest of my life was going to be vaguely unsatisfying. And therefore, the only perfect ending to the story would be death, my death. I told my friend there was no such thing as a perfect story. I said, in any case, hers was an external view of things. This assumption that the trajectory of a person's happiness, or let's say fulfillment, had peaked and now must trough because she had accidentally stumbled upon success. It was premised on the unimaginative belief that wealth and fame were the mandatory stuff of everybody's dreams. You've lived too long in New York, I told her. There are other worlds, other kinds of dreams. Dreams in which failure is feasible, honorable, sometimes even worth striving for. Words in which, worlds in which recognition is not the only barometer of brilliance or human worth. There are plenty of warriors whom I know and love, people far more valuable than myself, who go to war each day, knowing in advance that they will fail. True, they are less successful in the most vulgar sense of the world, word, but by no means less fulfilled. The only dream worth having, I told her, is to dream that you will live while you're alive, and die only when you're dead. Which means exactly what? Arched eyebrows, a little annoyed. I try to explain, but didn't do a very good job of it. Sometimes I need to write to think. So I wrote it down for her on a paper napkin. And this is what I wrote. To love, to be loved, to never forget your own insignificance to never get used to the unspeakable violence and the vulgar disparity of life around you, to seek joy in the saddest places, to pursue beauty to its lair, to never simplify what is complicated or complicate what is simple, to respect strength, never power, above all, to watch, to try and understand, to never look away, and never, never to forget. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that wonderful, wonderful court is a product of the humanity and the mastery of language of this uh, wonderful woman. Please uh, join me again in thanking Arundhati Thank Roy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.